the work of actual breathing, moving your lungs, becomes incredibly hard, right? And so if you have a wet, heavy lung and you have to move it more often than normal because you have a bunch of dead space, breathing just becomes really hard. What we're going to talk about is APRV. Uh, I think the title Haney gave me is why you should be using APRV, and I kind of changed that to why maybe you shouldn't hate APRV so much. And we're going to be doing a workshop a little later today when we get to like the nuts and bolts of how to do APRV. And so this is just more talking about why you should consider it and um, where the magic in APRV lies. Um, the other name for this is hashtag FRC, a guide to achieving ICU happiness. So FRC is something we're all familiar with when we talk about um, our respiratory physiology, but I think it's something we don't often think about in the ICU. Um, and I'm here to convince you that maybe we should spend a little more time actually thinking about it and understanding where your patients are in regards to FRC. And to kind of talk about this, I think we have to start with ARDS, or at least it's a, a reasonable model to kind of understand this. And if you ask most of our trainees what ARDS is, usually they start to talk about the Berlin definition, right? Um, and if we try to recall these, essentially what you're talking about is bilateral opacities on the chest X-ray, five of PEEP, non-cardiac origin, and then you have your PDF ratio, which is divided into mild, moderate, severe. And when you think about this for a second, the first three variables are essentially just ways to exclude mimics of ARDS, right? And then you're just down to a PDF ratio, and what you're doing here is quantifying the shunt fraction. The more oxygen you need to maintain an F uh, to, or more oxygen you need to maintain an O2 sat or a PaO2, the smaller the lung is, the more lung that's de-recruited and not participating in ventilation, right? And there's a lot of debate on whether this is a good definition of ARDS or not. And overall, it's moderate, at least diagnosing the disease, but that's not the problem. I think any definition you have, the problem becomes, the definition becomes the disease, right? And so we think about ARDS as this disease rather than this, right? What the Berlin criteria is trying to tell you is you've got a big, wet, heavy lung that's not participating in ventilation. And the more lung that's wet and heavy and de-recruited, the worse the ARDS is, right? And when you start thinking about it as a definition rather than a disease, you kind of exist in this dichotomy. Either your lungs are great and happy and there's no problems, or I'm in ARDS. But in reality, your lungs are somewhere at FRC, right? Like we all are now, just hanging out comfortably. And then you exist at some amount of de-recruitment, and at some point you reach ARDS. And the problem is, by the time you've reached ARDS, it's far too late. And so in reality, no one should be surprised when their patients develop ARDS, right? This is something you should have seen coming if you are aware of FRC and where your patient is in relation to it. So why APRV is beneficial in this? APRV is essentially a mode of ventilation that uses a high pressure to get patients back to FRC. Most of the disease states, excluding maybe asthma, which you just talked about, um, are diseases where your lung has gotten wet, wet and heavy and you're below FRC, and that's where your respiratory distress comes from. But if the patient has an intact respiratory drive and normal uh, respiratory muscles, if you can get them back to FRC, they can start to breathe normal and they can start to function better. And so, I think the easiest way to think about APRV is CPAP. Right? It's a pressure level meant to reinflate the lung, put you at FRC, and allow the patient to breathe on their own. The problem with this as a concept, because if, if this worked perfectly, I would never need APRV. I could just put everyone on CPAP. I could just turn my PEEP dial up and down until I found the right PEEP to put the person at FRC and then just let them breathe. Anyone who's worked in the ICU with ventilated patients know that doesn't work for the most part, right? Um, and the reason is because the lung is what's called viscoelastic, meaning it changes over time. It doesn't just change instantly. And so when you put someone on a pressure that you're hoping to bring them back to FRC, it takes time for them to recruit. And in that moment, they're so far below it, it's hard for them to breathe. And so you have to help them, right? And that's what APRV is, right? It's this dropout or this release in the pressure. And in those moments, you breathe off CO2. So we're going to talk about how you do that a little later in the workshop, but what I want to convince you now is you want your patients at FRC because everything gets easier when you're there, right? 
dead space. We talked a little bit about dead space in the, in the previous lecture, but dead space is vital, right? As the lung D recruits and gets smaller and smaller, the dead space goes up and up. You've all seen this. Anyone who's treated a patient with ARDS sees that their minute ventilation requirements are through the roof. They have minute ventilations of 14 or so, and in, with that, their PCO2s are actually incredibly high, right? As you get the lung back to FRC, the dead space goes down. You've also probably managed people that are completely desynchronous on the ventilator, right? Part of that is this dead space. The, uh, we go completely insane if our CO2s go above normal. It drives us crazy, right? It gives us tons of air hunger. And having to manage a CO2 for a patient when they have to breathe way more than normal will make them really uncomfortable on the ventilator. With that, when you're below FRC, the work of actual breathing, moving your lungs, becomes incredibly hard, right? And so if you have a wet, heavy lung and you have to move it more often than normal because you have a bunch of dead space, breathing just becomes really hard. As you get back to FRC, you've reestablished normal lung mechanics and the work of breathing comes so much easier. So the, there's a lot of what I would say myths about the hemodynamics on APRV, meaning you see a lot of human innate instability. And for the most part, if you look at the randomized control trials on this, the patients randomized to APRV had less pressors, less inotrope requirements, less hypotension than the ones that not. Again, because the heart functions better at FRC. And that isn't only the left heart, the right heart as well functions. This is our one physiological side. But when you're at FRC, your pulmonary vascular resistance is at its lowest. So again, people with RV dysfunction do much better when you get them back to FRC. See, right? This is part of the shock you see in ARDS. When the lung is way below FRC, the right heart isn't too happy. Fixing FRC will fix the paper. We'll fix this as well. Sedation. Um, again, in the RCT data, much less sedation with patients on APRV than patients not on APRV. And I think this is twofold. One, CPAP, which is essentially what APRV is, is the most comfortable mode of ventilation, right? They can control their flows, they can control the, the, the volumes, they control when or when they don't want to breathe, right? And so overall, it's a much more comfortable mode. I think the other factor that, again, is not given too much credit is this minute ventilation, right? When patients' minute ventilation requirements are super high and they're having trouble maintaining their CO2, they're just not gonna be comfortable. And you're gonna have to suppress this huge respiratory drive. But when you get their minute ventilation requirements back down to normal, all of a sudden you'll see they'll be far more comfortable on the vent, irregardless of what mode you're on. You can be on the most uncomfortable mode. As long as they don't have trouble managing their CO2, they'll be far more comfortable. Barotrauma. So again, in the RCT data, less pneumothorax, less sign of barotrauma in the APRV group compared to the control group. And the lung is often thought of as a balloon, and then sometimes we think of it as grapes right? But those aren't really that accurate. What more so it looks like is a honeycomb. And what you mean like this is the alveolar walls are shared by the alveolar, right? And they kind of tent each other open. So the pressure of one supports the pressure in the one next to it, right? And so as you lose alveolar and de-recruit, you start to see an increase in pressure pushing over from one to the other, right? And so with fewer and fewer alveoli, you're putting more and more stress on the remaining alveoli that's open, right? And so as you get to FRC and re-expand that lung, your pressure is diffused over a much greater surface area than it would be otherwise. Okay, so that's really it. This is why we want to get to FRC. What APRV does, there's nothing magic about it. It really just makes you think about it, right? Your goal on APRV every day is basically saying, am I at FRC? And if not, how do I get there? Um, and when you start using it a lot, even in the patients you're not using APRV, you have an awareness of where the patient is in relation to FRC and the things you have to do to get them back to it. Thank you.